everybody. Reporting to you again from the glamour city, Hollywood. In biology, the phenotype is the physiology, the appearance, and the behavior of an organism. And just to give you a personal example, a few years ago, I went hiking in the Himalaya Mountains and went to a very high elevation, higher than I'd ever been before. And when I got to that higher elevation, my body automatically started to adjust. My blood composition started to change, new genes were turned on, um, my behavior changed, um, I slowed down in my movements. And I didn't have to think about any of these things. It wasn't like, it's like, oh, now I'm at high elevation, I have to do something different. My body perceived that change in environment and automatically responded in ways that allowed me to survive in that new environment. Mm -hmm. In that case, my phenotype was changing. This kind of thing happens all the time in nature. It happens seasonally. It happens with changes in weather. Um, it, has a cha- it happens with changes in environmental conditions. And all organisms have some ability to adjust their phenotype to be able to deal with environmental change. So it, I think of this as often like the first line of defense for organisms that are facing environmental change because they can often do this you know, in minutes to hours to weeks. The challenge for organisms becomes when they sort of use up their ability to adjust phenotypically uh, because their environment is changing too fast or too much, they then have to shift to other um, kinds of responses. So, for example, that coral example from earlier, the ability of corals, the increased ability of corals to withstand higher temperatures is probably a combination of that, that phenotypic adjustment plus evolution. If you love listening to this show, please consider giving a rating and a review on Amazon Alexa or wherever you listen. We want to continue bringing you this amazing content, and part of our ability to do that means that we need a big audience. Now, it may not seem like much, but rating and reviewing the show will help more people find us, just like how you found this show. Simply on any podcast platform, search for a show, scroll down to the bottom, and push five stars. It's that easy. Thanks for supporting the show. Today, I'm joined by Dr. Michael Meta Webster, who is a professor of practice in the Department of Environmental Studies at NYU, and he's the author of The Rescue Effect, The Key to Saving Life on Earth. Welcome to the show today. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. So you have a background in zoology, and your research focuses on how to promote the adaptation of species and ecosystems to ongoing environmental change. And of course, you've contributed to lots of different papers, including the one that's very well cited from nature, population diversity, and the portfolio effect and exploited species as an example. Can you tell us more about your areas of research? Sure. I was originally trained as an ecologist. So I worked on coral reefs mostly, trying to understand why different animals were found where they were, or why they were more or less abundant, and how that changed over time. Um, And I got my PhD doing that sort of research. But As I was doing that kind of research, I really got more and more concerned about how ecosystems were changing and working on coral reefs when things like coral bleaching were happening and coral reefs were changing very quickly. um, I decided to make a career shift as I finished out my PhD and work more on the management and conservation side of things. So how do we use information about ecosystems and species to do a better job of helping to manage and conserve them? So you, you mentioned coral reefs, and of course, before your, um, your, your current role at NYU, you were an executive director of the Coral Reef Alliance. And I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about that particular role and how you saw firsthand maybe the power of reef building corals. Sure. So I was the executive director of the Coral Reef Alliance for about eight years. And, you know, my role there as executive director was many, many fold, but one of them was to try and figure out what was this organization going to be doing to try and save coral reefs around the world. And this organization was very good at working with communities and helping to find ways that communities could benefit from their reefs, but uh, at the same time, not necessarily undermine those reefs and looking for that sort of balance point between economic interests and conservation. And I think that's a really promising way to think about conservation. But one of the questions that arose for me in that process was a bigger picture question around, is that going to add up to something that's going to make a difference for coral reefs in the long run? Great to do small scale work. And that's actually put me on the path toward this book today, which is really thinking about the kinds of things we can do in conservation that are going to have a meaningful effect for organisms like corals that are experiencing a really rapidly changing world. So you actually bring up a really profound 
question uh, statement, which is this notion that uh, through many, uh, many programs, right, uh, the Greenpeace, uh, the United Nations, and many NGOs that are out there, where we're actually doing things, and of course, certainly around core reefs as well, and people feel like they're making an effect in terms of uh, conservation and, and preservation and protection. But yet, uh, this notion that what we're doing, is it going to even make a difference in the big picture? And more importantly, um, you know, I think uh, one of the assertions you're ma making is that does life on Earth potentially save itself? And the title of your book is called The Rescue Effect, The Key to Saving Life on Earth. I wonder if you could tell us about how your research and your area of expertise eventually led you to write this particular book. Yeah, just to pick up on one thought and then I'll go there is that, you know, those kinds of sort of localized conservation programs that you're you're describing, they almost always have uh, sh short and medium term benefits to communities and people interacting with the resource. The, the question is, do they also provide these longer term benefits? And for me, one of the turning points in this was looking at coral reefs and asking the question of, do we have reason to believe that the corals that build the reefs are going to be able to adapt to the world that's changing fast enough to keep playing that role? Or are we destined for a future where we really don't have coral reefs anymore and the corals are not building these structures, they're not providing the economic benefits through fisheries and shoreline protection and tourism that they currently provide? And so when I started asking these questions, there wasn't actually a very good answer to that in the scientific literature. And I asked lots of experts if they could like summarize what was known on that. And it was not actually that clear. And so a number of years ago, along with colleagues from scientific institutions, as well as conservation organizations, we decided to take a stab at answering this question. And so we built this big mathematical scenarios model that modeled climate change, and it did its best to model corals and coral reefs. And it allowed us to essentially compare scenarios about things like climate change, things like management that people might choose to do to try and help coral reefs, and ask, are those likely to make a difference in the long run? And the answers we got were actually somewhat optimistic, which is that corals seem, at least based on the models, to have a pretty good ability to adapt to things like warmer waters and uh, things like local management can help in that process. But there is a caveat that really only looks somewhat rosy like that if we do begin to bend the curve on climate change. If we don't do anything about climate change, it's going to get to be a harder and harder world for corals to survive. But that optimism that came out of there for me was around agency, which is we're not at a stage where we've necessarily lost coral reefs and the decisions that we make today can make a really big difference to what happens in the future. And there's the inspiration for the book, which is to try and understand where are we in this process of changing our planet and changing biology and changing nature and what kinds of futures are possible? And can we do things today to ensure that we have a future that's bright? Yeah, you bring up some excellent points. And, and let me just uh, focus on this notion of the fact that uh, we're still very much in it. And there is an opportunity to have a direct um, intervention and uh, impact. But I want to go back to the broader study that you and your peers have worked on, which is this mathematical statistical modeling. And, and I wonder in those modeling, how do you go about actually measuring against actual possible results, given the fact that these are statistical scenarios with uh, some sort of modeling, right? Based on some sort of methodology. Sure, and I'll uh, begin by saying that my job in that research group was not to do the modeling itself. Um, that isn't my expertise. So I will speak to it as someone who is involved in the project, but forgive me if I don't get the model details correct. Um, so, you know, what is the old saying? Um, all models are wrong, some models are useful. And so you can't necessarily take a model and say that is how the world will be. But what you can do with a model is you can, you can test sort of many variations on a theme and try to make the model as realistic as possible. So in this model, what it's really looking at is the ability of corals to move around in an area of ocean through reproduction and populate new reefs and change in abundance as well as evolve new traits. And in this case, the key trait is the ability to live at higher and higher temperatures. And there's some really important um, uh, parameters that go into that model, one of which is the what's called the heritable genetic variance of corals. And this is quantifies essentially how much of a coral's ability to live at higher or lower temperatures is determined genetically and how much variability in that 
trait exists across the population. And what the models all show is that if there's some of that heritable genetic variation in the population, evolution can actually happen uh, on timescales that can keep up with moderate mm. levels of climate change. Mm. If you draw that all the way down to zero, well, they can't evolve. And essentially what's going to have to happen for corals to keep up in the world that's changing is they're going to have to go through an evolutionary process. Now, we think that the parameters we're using, and we look across a range, are in the ballpark for corals. It's a difficult thing to measure. Um, but realistic amounts of that variation do lead to um, evolution on these sort of decadal to century um, timescales. Yeah. Well, thank you for that. I appreciate it. I think uh, two questions. One is around um, actual evidence in the real world right now that points to some of these uh, theories that, uh, you know, that there's some validity to it from an empirical perspective. And then the other aspect is, again, I think uh, most of us would agree this na nature's innate ability to persist and adapt to the environmental changes. That's pretty consistent with the modern theory of evolution, right? In terms of kind of, you're just taking that and broadening the scope uh, from the neo darwin view of evolution that incorporates you know population genetics development of biology paleontology as an example uh, to some of these other what you call six rescue effects uh, so i wonder you know i'm just trying to understand while it's consistent where are the areas that is really you know profound or revolutionary or, or is it the optimism that you're bringing in this book that perhaps maybe is missing from some of the other literatures so there's a lot of questions in there. Let me try and take a few and you can remind me if I miss some. Um, one, is there any evidence that corals uh, are going to be able to do this? The answer is yes. Some people who are looking very closely at corals and their ability to evolve and their genetic variants are finding that, that you know, the requisite ingredients seem to be out there. The other thing that we can see is when we look at corals more broadly, we can see that in the last few decades, they've actually gotten better at living at higher temperatures. However, it's difficult to discern whether that, ability, that increase in ability is uh, evolutionary or what we would call phenotypic, basically an adjustment to different. It's probably a combination of both, but we don't have a good estimate of what, what is each there. So that's the, the, the coral part. You also get at the, the title of the book, which is the rescue effect. So the way that I define the rescue effect in the book is that nature has an inherent tendency to um, rescue itself, that when individuals or organisms are faced with a changing environment, there's a whole bunch of processes in biology that automatically turn on to help those organisms um, uh, adapt to their changing environment. Just one of those is evolution. And um, I, you know, I break it down into six different processes which are oftentimes happening at the same time. And so these are layered together. In fact, if you look at that model of corals, it includes at least four of these different processes that are show up either in, in direct or indirect ways in that model. And they're all working together to help corals adjust to that changing environment. So let me pause there. You had another question at the end, but I think I've lost the thread. No, I think I think that's fine. Mm -hmm. This is this is a, actually a great uh, segue to talk about the six rescue effects. Now, what, we've been talking primarily about the coral reefs, but can you also provide maybe a few other examples in nature where some of these models actually still apply? Sure. Um, uh, so when we think about the rescue effect, like I said, there's there's six different things going on. One of the ones that's getting triggered all over the planet right now is what in the book I refer to as geographic rescue. And this is when an organism, organisms live in places where the environment is suitable for their survival. And with environmental change, particularly when you think about something like climate change, every place on the earth is going through a change in things like temperatures, precipitation, fire regimes in the ocean, chemistry, all sorts of things are changing. And what that means is that for some organisms, they're finding themselves in places that, are, that aren't as suitable for them as they used to be. Now, they might evolve to deal with those new changes in environment, but one thing they might be able to do much easier and much faster is actually just move to a different location that maybe didn't used to be suitable for them, but the conditions have actually gotten better there for them now. And what we're seeing is this sort of beginnings of mass movements of species ranges all over the world. You can think of it in the Northern hemisphere as species for the most part move from the South to the North, essentially tracking climate. They may not be able to find exactly their preferred climate, but they may find something that works better for them. So we're seeing lots of species that are starting to shift northward. And in the mountains, we're seeing species that are starting to go up in elevation, again, tracking their um, preferred environmental conditions. And this is not something new. If you go back to the end of the last ice age, much of North America was covered in glaciers. When those glaciers retreated, they left bare rock. 
all those places now are covered in prairies and forests and lakes and rivers that are filled with species. They were all recolonized as the climate changed and those species moved into that new habitat. So that same kind of movement is being triggered today. So the, the, I think the thing that, that really kind of uh, is in, interesting for me is this notion of the six pieces all working together in conjunction at different rates. And then the other thing that you talked about is all, everything we're talking about is fairly dynamic, right? So it's, there's a adaptation of these organisms and species, but then there's the change of rate from a climate change perspective as well. So all of those are very dynamic levers. And I wonder... Um, Will all species, and again, this is a tough one, right? Uh, will all species be able to adapt quickly enough or would some of them actually uh, likely go extinct? So that's one question. And the second thing is using the example of migration from south to north, there's going to be a finite set of area, whether it's in the water or land or ice. And so there's a, there's a scarcity, right? And, and I wonder how some of that and some of the other six uh, attributes of the rescue effects come in to help mitigate some of those natural uh, scarcity issues. Yeah. Um, uh, so on the, on the second part around scarcity, listen, there's a couple of different things going on, right? In order for a species to move from one place to another place, it has to, there's two conditions, right? That other place that's suitable has to exist and the species has to be able to get from here, from where it is to there. Now, some species are good at getting around and they move around quite well. And, you know, as long as there's some habitat, that's going to work out fine. But one of the reasons I wanted to write this book is because we've got a whole bunch of new kind of dilemmas and challenges coming in conservation. And one of these is around species that need to move to persist. And do we start moving them on purpose? So do we take things that are, say, in the south and pick them up and put them in the north where we think they're going to do better in the future? Usually in conservation, if we're talking about small distance movements from you know, here to here, that's right now not necessarily that controversial. But there are cases where moving animals farther is going to be required if we want them to persist. So one of the stories in the book is about this uh, marsupial in Australia that lives on mountaintops in uh, southeastern Australia in a, in a winter snowy environment and it hibernates. Climate change is making its lifestyle more and more difficult and there's a question about can they persist there? The answer is probably no. So that gets at your first question. Um, uh, we certainly will see more extinctions the faster that uh, change is happening and not all species are going to be able to adapt. In that case, people are actually considering picking some of those species, those individuals up and moving them somewhere else uh, to see if they can survive in a completely different kind of habitat in another place where maybe they'll be able to persist going forward. And that kind of thing is a new kind of question in conservation. And there's lots of pros and cons. People mm -hmm. sometimes get concerned about moving new species to new places and what if they have negative effects? So how do we think about that as uh, you know, people who have to make judgment calls really about whether these species are gonna have a chance to persist? That, that, that is very interesting. And I, I could definitely imagine some of the pros and cons around that. Uh, I want to focus in a couple of the areas uh, within the, um, the rescue effects. That's quite interesting. One is the genetic aspects, the uh, mm -hmm. uh, genetic diversity. Uh, and then the other uh, that you've mentioned already is the phenotypic rescue, which deals with the more of the physical and biochemical characteristics of organisms. If you could elaborate on that and how those play a role in terms of some of these adaptations. So um, what I call in the book phenotypic rescue is uh, in, in biology, the phenotype is the physiology, the appearance and the behavior of an organism. And just to give you a personal example, a few years ago, I went hiking in the Himalaya mountains and went to a very high elevation, higher than I'd ever been before. And when I got to that higher elevation, my body automatically started to adjust my blood composition started to change, new genes were turned on, um, my behavior changed, um, I slowed down in my movements, and I didn't have to think about any of these things. It wasn't like, it's like, oh, now I'm at high, high elevation, I have to do something different. My body perceived that change in environment and automatically responded in ways that allowed me to survive in that new environment. Mm -hmm. In that case, my phenotype was changing. 
this kind of thing happens all the time in nature. It happens seasonally. It happens with changes in weather. Um, it has a cha- it happens with changes in environmental conditions. And all organisms have some ability to adjust their phenotype to be able to deal with environmental change. So it, I think of this as often like the first line of defense for organisms that are facing environmental change because they can often do this, you know, in minutes to hours to weeks where they can change their phenotype. And so this is ubiquitous in nature. The challenge for organisms becomes when they sort of use up their ability to adjust phenotypically uh, because their environment is changing too fast or too much, they then have to shift to other um, kinds of responses. So for example, that coral example from earlier, the ability of corals, to, the increased ability of corals to withstand higher temperatures is probably a combination of that, that phenotypic adjustment plus evolution. Yeah, makes perfect sense. Um, let's talk about the role of humans and you started to provide maybe an example earlier, but what is the role of humans and how do you explain that in your book? Yeah. So the, 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 the concept of the rescue effect is really about what nature can do on its own to adjust to change. And based on what I've seen, organisms are quite good at this. So the rescue effect is quite strong in nature, but it's not all powerful. And so what happens for organisms is that as the rate of change goes up and the amount of change increases, the ability of the rescue effect to keep up gets you know, more and more questionable. And so if we want organisms to survive, if we want species to persist, there's really two ways that we can work this equation. One is we can try and reduce the rate of change. And I would say, especially on things like global climate change, if we can begin to bend that curve on climate change, it's going to make a difference for almost all life on Earth. So that's the biggest one in terms of changing the rates. The other way we work this equation is to look at the rescue effect and those six different components of the rescue effect. We have tools in conservation to essentially artificially boost all of those. So we can look to what nature is capable on of its own, and then we can try and find ways to increase the amount or um, rate at which any of those processes is working to help organisms adapt faster. So on the, on the latter part that you mentioned, um, help us to understand, uh, because so much of the effort, uh, like we talked about early on in terms of NGO is fairly localized. So how do we make these effects uh, on a global scale using some of these um, some of these methodologies? Some of these I would go species by species. So to give you an example, one of the chapters in the book is about the American chestnut tree, which disappeared from Eastern North America's forests starting at about 1904, when it got hit by a disease that was accidentally imported from Asia. This disease over a period of decades went on to wipe out pretty much every tree in that system. Now these trees didn't go extinct because they kept growing from their roots. And so there were uh, uh, little suckers that kept coming up and people decided they wanted to try and bring this tree back, but the disease had become endemic in the environment. Mm -hmm. So they looked for some trees that maybe showed a little bit of resistance to the disease and started to try to breed them. This is selective breeding. And in some cases, selective breeding does work and allows an organism to get through uh, something like a new disease. In this case, it didn't work. There actually wasn't enough of that genetic variance for ability to resist this disease. So people started doing something a little bit more radical. They took Asian species of chestnut trees that had evolutionary history with the disease, and they started making hybrids with American species of chestnut trees, hoping that the hybrids would look a little bit like an American chestnut, taste a little bit like an American chestnut, but have the disease resistant of one of these, the resistance of one of these Asian species. And they've been doing that crossbreeding for a hundred years now with some effect. They've got trees that are better at dealing with the disease and have a mix of traits between the two species. More recently, Researchers have used genetic engineering to try and give the pure American chestnut tree um, some new evolutionary capabilities. And they've taken a single gene out of wheat, which helps wheat fight fungal diseases. Mm. And they've inserted that gene into the genome of American chestnut. And now these genetically modified chestnut trees are better at fighting the disease and surviving. In fact, we're at this point right now where they are actually seeking um, approval to freely plant these trees um, from the USDA and other federal agencies. And so we're at a point in conservation where we have 
um, potentially our very first genetically modified organism for conservation, which shows a couple of things. One, it shows that we can use things like biotechnology for conservation, but it's also teeing up this conservation, this, this more bigger, broader conversation about values and ethics and whether those are the right tools to be using and whether we want to have genetically modified trees. And so it's a, it's a very interesting sort of microcosm for how technology is interacting with conservation and raising all sorts of new questions. Yeah, it's fascinating, and I, I love I love that you're introducing uh, notions of uh, gene editing, such as CRISPR Cas9. So, in the case of uh, you know the chestnut trees, makes perfect sense. Uh, but things or large organisms, let's take the example of whales, for instance, where mm-hmm. many of them have been beaching, and you know they're getting um, uh, um, stranded, and and many of them are are dying. Dying. How do you actually help them? Um, yeah. And given the fact that they're all over the globe. <clears throat> So I'm not an expert on whales, so uh, I'm on a little bit of thin ice here. Um, I, I don't I don't necessarily believe that beaching, um, stranding is what's necessarily causing whales to be at risk of extinction. The reality is we have a fraught history with whales, and you know humans used to hunt a lot of whales and cause a lot of whale populations to decline precipitously. With the end of most commercial whaling on the planet, actually a lot of whales have bounced back. And using the terminology from the book, they've bounced back through reproductive rescue and have uh, um, uh, their populations have increased tremendously. There are some species for which that's not true. For example, northern right whales are having a really hard time coming back. And again, here's where I'm on thin ice. My understanding is that a lot of the mortality for those animals is coming from things like um, fishing gear and entanglement, as well as uh, strikes from um, a large scale, uh, you know, like container ships in the ocean and tankers. Um, and so I may have gotten that a little bit wrong, but the, but if you want a species that is suffering from that kind of problem to persist, you actually have to go at those sources of mortality and say, how can we actually reduce or mitigate these sources of mortality? Because at a certain point, species can only handle so much external mortality before their populations begin to decline. So in some ways, that's a little bit more traditional conservation where, for example, if if ship strikes are the problem, maybe you can reroute shipping routes to avoid high density whale areas. But that will come at a cost because those shipping lanes are designed to be most efficient from a fuel and a time perspective. So essentially, it's a societal cost. If you want uh, whales not to get hit by ships and you're willing to drive the ships farther, great. But at the end of the day, it's either going to have to be regulated or uh, incentivized in order to get that uh, change in behavior. So this is a a great segue to my uh, follow-up question, which is around human intervention and how do we actually create this collective action? So you know, as we speak, uh, I think the world is very much uh, at the doorstep of a global recession. Yeah, so you're starting to see economies and state actors that have very much been a, a big advocate for uh, climate action, backpedaling a little bit in terms of, you know, going back to petrol-based oil and gas, as well as saying, you know, fighting domestic inflation is more important than, let's say, you know, climate change summit, as an example. So we're starting to see some Great progress, but then we're also starting to backpedal a little bit. And then going to the going back to the example of whaling, yes, there has been um, I think decrease in whaling. However, you know, Japan as a nation has kind of made it a mantra for them to bring back whaling, and so so there's you know a lot of Greenpeace uh, Greenpeace efforts being made to intervene uh, against some of these ships that are going out there harpooning these wells. So talk about um, how do we create this global collective action to yeah. really make a difference because of the fact is no one part of a, a earth can actually make this happen unless everybody's united. Yeah. I mean, listen, I don't have a silver bullet, you know, magic answer for you. That's just going to make all these problems go away. At the end of the day, conservation is hard work. Um, it takes a long time and it really only happens because people value nature and they choose to um, fight for it. And you've listed many different conservation NGOs that do that kind of work. At the end of the day, if you care about nature and you want to do something about it, there's a few different things you can do. One, you can look target the species of the ecosystems that you really care about and either try and do something for them yourself or try and support those organizations that are actively trying to save those species. 
Um, on the other end of it, you know, I think the solving climate is really a global question that is sort of undeniably requires cooperation from people around the world. There are things that individuals can do with respect to their uh, climate footprint and trying to reduce their personal effect on that. But at the end of the day, pe well-meaning people are not going to, I don't believe, just add up to a solution to climate change. We have to get governments, uh, you know, local, regional, national, and international on board with making what are probably going to be some harder decisions about shifting energy sources uh, and investment. That is, that is definitely not my expertise area for how we do that. And, you know, my sense is that we have not gone nearly far enough. So I hope your prediction that potential recession doesn't set us back really far. Maybe there will be opportunities within an economic change to um, justify certain investments that maybe have longer term financial benefits. I don't know. I like to be an optimist on these things, um, but I don't think I've got a simple answer for you. Um, what I do believe, though, is that we have the ability to make a series of decisions, including decisions on climate, that uh, al will allow the rescue effect to work for most species. They will allow most of what we have on the planet to persist and the tools that we bring to the table for helping particular species and ecosystems on top of that um, are really powerful. So overall, I'm optimistic that we have agency here. The question is, are we going to choose to act uh, to secure that future? And I, I don't have an easy answer for you on that. I'm certainly hopeful that the answer is yes. Yeah, great. Now, what's interesting is that these rescue effects are also in many ways applicable to human survival, right? So I wonder uh, if you could talk a little bit about that and how these effects, we're already starting to see some of this in the human species, such as the massive migratory movements across the globe, for example. Yeah, so each of those different, you know, I, I'm a biologist, humans are a species like any other, um, and there have been more species of humans in our evolutionary history. Um, uh, and so th we have every reason to believe that we're subject to the, the rescue effect, just like anything else would. I would say that we are probably uh, the best species ever in the history of the planet at phenotypic rescue which means that we can adjust our behavior, particularly our behavior, in ways that allow us to live in almost any environment, um, pretty much anywhere across the globe. And that's been, you know, I think part of the story of really human spreading around the planet. I think part of your question is also getting at that because we are now changing the environment globally, we're making some places on the planet that are less and less suitable for people for biological as well as you know economic and political reasons and social reasons. Um, and that is triggering some movements of people around the globe. There probably would be more movements around the globe if you know we didn't have um, so much emphasis on national borders on the planet. Um, uh, but that is, a, you know, in a lot of ways, a logical response from people if they're finding the environment that they're in to not be suitable to try and choose to move to another location. In that case, it's essentially an example of in the rescue effect sort of framework of geographic rescue. But the difference with people is that it can be a conscious move. Geographic rescue in nature is largely a statistical process of some individuals happen to get to a place that didn't used to be suitable for them and they find that it's now suitable and they reap the rewards of having done so and have progeny and spread in that direction. In the human case, we actually have the ability to understand that these other places exist and try to deliberately move to them, which could make movements around the planet much more fluid, um, except for all the, like, the political and social and economic barriers that exist to that. Okay. So uh, we've covered quite a bit, uh, but I'm sure there's a lot more in the book. Is there anything else you want to call out from the book that you want to uh, focus on? Yeah. So there's a lot of biology, there's a lot of conservation and in the book, but what I would like people to know is that I've tried to approach all this content through really interesting stories, stories about different places and different species, how they're adapting and how people can help. And I think what that will allow people to do is sort of get an insider view into what's happening today in conservation so that as we move forward and many of these new kinds of questions that are going to arise happen, people will have sort of a hopefully some new um, uh, touch points for understanding what's happening on the planet and so that they can participate in these conversations about you know, what we're going to do and how we're going to do it.
Well, I've been joined by Professor Michael Meta Webster, the author of The Rescue Effect, The Key to Saving Life on Earth. Thanks for joining today. Thank you. If you've enjoyed this episode, take a moment to rate our show on any podcast platform that you listen to. Scroll down to the bottom and push five stars. It's that easy. And as always, thanks for listening.